Alejandro Adolf has our scripture reading for this morning. I'm reading from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. Every kind of animal, animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by hu humankind, but no one can, can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God. God's likeness, blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Thank you, Alejandro. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're needy people. Uh, we need your instruction, we need your wisdom, we need your guidance, and so this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would instruct us through your word. Father, we know that you've given us your word to help us become more like Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd take these words today from your messenger and apply them to our hearts and give us wisdom on how we might be different because of our time together in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If I was to ask you what's the most important part of your body, I'm wondering what you might say. Some might say it's um, my brain, or maybe my hands, or my feet, or my eyes, or nose, or ears. Uh, maybe everyone would say something different. A number of years ago, I remember reading an article in uh, Sports Illustrated. In fact, it was on the cover. And basically, it says, how do you put together the perfect quarterback? And what they did in that article was talked about different skills that different quarterbacks had. And so... I don't know if it was maybe John Elway's athleticism and, and Tom Brady's um, intelligence and knowledge of the game or maybe it was uh, Lamar Jackson's running ability or whatever, but they, they actually made kind of a, a composite of all these pieces of the perfect quarterback to say this would be the ideal quarterback. And you know, Sometimes we think about certain aspects of ourselves as more important than others. And today we're going to be looking at one which is actually the tongue or our speech. And um, Charles Swindoll in his book Seasons of Life wrote this. He said, the tongue, what a study in contrast. To the physician, it's merely a two-ounce slab of mucous membrane enclosing a complex array of muscles and nerves that enable our bodies to chew, taste, and swallow. How helpful! Equally significant is the major organ of communication that enables us to articulate distinct sounds so that we can understand each other. How essential! Without the tongue, no mother could sing her baby to sleep tonight. No ambassador could adequately represent our nation. No teacher could stretch the minds of students. No officer could lead his fighting men in battle. No attorney could defend the truth in court. No pastor could comfort troubled souls. No complicated, controversial issue could ever be discussed and solved. Our entire world would be reduced to unintelligible grunts and shrugs. Seldom do we pause to realize just how valuable this strange muscle in our mouths really is. You know, one thing that I've learned over the years, especially in counseling and listening to people's stories, it's that, that saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt you. It's absolutely wrong. Words can definitely hurt. And sometimes the impact of destructive words carry a scar much worse than any beating or any injury or any physical ailment could, um, could carry with us. Our speech certainly can be destructful and hurtful. And in the book of James, um, in James chapter 3, the Lord gives us four warnings concerning the use of our tongues or the use of our speech. So if you have your Bibles or if you have a Bible app, um, turn to James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And we're going to be looking at these four warnings. And if you haven't been here, um, let me just fill you in a little bit. The book of James was written by Jesus' half-brother. 
um, and that he was not a believer until after the resurrection, but he came to be the head of the church in Jerusalem. And he's writing to a group of Jewish believers um, who have come to know Jesus as their Messiah, and they've been scattered all over the known world due to persecution. And so they have a lot of different needs, and we've been going over them uh, as we've been going through this book. Uh, Last week we talked about the importance of using your faith and putting it to work, because that'll keep your faith from dying or becoming ineffective. And today he's going to be focusing on our speech, our language, our words, and he uses the picture of our tongue. And so the first warning we see in the first five verses, and it's that our speech is powerful. Listen to what he says. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able also to control the whole body. Now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies and consider ships. Though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. So he begins with his first warning, be careful or be warned, our tongues or our speech is powerful. Again, a lot of people might not think about that. I mean, words are just words, they might say. Um, And he begins with a warning. He warns those who wish to be teachers. And I believe probably at that time, um, teaching was a very honored position. It was one that people in the whole culture looked up to. And so it was something that was very coveted. And today, I think maybe it's a little bit the opposite that a lot of people don't choose teaching as a career because it doesn't pay well. And those that do do it, they must have an idea that there's something rewarding about teaching. But to those in in that day, they probably just thought of it as um, something that was very honored and one that would give them um, attention, responsibility, uh, prestige, Um, And so there were a lot of people that wanted to be teachers. But James is giving some counsel here from the Holy Spirit saying, be careful. If you're going to be a teacher, realize that you will receive a stricter judgment. In other words, you're going to have to give an account of what you say. And, And God will take note of how you use your words and how you use your platform. And I'm not going to get political right now, but it is something that came into my mind as, um, as I was putting this, um, this sermon together is about um, our candidates for, for president. One is not saying anything, and one is probably talking too much, and I'll let you figure out which one's which. But I think it definitely applies the importance of using our words rightly. Um, Verse 2 says, a controlled tongue, or our speech, reveals a person's character. It says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able to control the whole body. In some translations, um, the word in the Greek um, here is translated mature, and others it's perfect. And the idea isn't that it's... um, without flaw or that it reaches a 100% standard, but that it's, it's brought to maturity. In other words, you can tell a spiritually mature person by the way they use the, their language or their tongue or their speech. Because he says, we all stumble in many ways. I remember we had a Bible study one time at, uh, at Irene and Bill Lytle's house and that was a pretty good group there, and I can't remember the exact topic, but I posed a question. I, I said, what's your favorite sin? And they all kind of laughed because, of course, no one wanted to share their favorite sin. But we certainly do all have areas of weakness, and we probably wouldn't use the word favorite, but if people looked at our lives, they'd say, that must be your favorite sin because you sure do it a lot. <laughs> and here he's saying, for a lot of people, for most people, it's 
their language, their tongue, their speech. A stumble here is a word that means a failure in a duty, not fatal, but certainly a hindrance in our walk. And I think that's why it says stumble, because stumble and walk can go together. If you're not walking good, you might stumble. Or if you look at a, a little toddler learning to walk, they stumble really easily. Or if you look at a person that's up in years, that's the biggest fear is that they're going to fall. And so he's saying, if you want to live in a way that you don't have a fall, you have to be careful how you walk, and that's related to controlling your tongue, controlling your speech. And so basically what he's talking about here is that if we can control our tongue, it demonstrates a high level of Christian maturity. Not perfection, but, but the idea of you're growing towards Christ-likeness. If one can control his speech or his tongue, he's likely to be disciplined in other areas. Jesus told his followers that your words reveal your heart. In Matthew 12, 34, it says, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. And so if you hear somebody that their language is full of cursing and foul words, that isn't just something they picked up from their peers. It reveals something about their heart. Or if you hear somebody that is full of positive things and blessing and praise to God, that isn't just something that, that they've learned. It's something that comes from the heart. And so maybe it'd be a good question to ask ourselves, what does my speech, what does my words uh, reveal about my heart? And then he illustrates again the same point of our speech or our tongue being powerful by illustrating the importance of small things that control bigger things, or the importance of controlling small things, starting in verse 3. He says, now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole body. How many of you have, have rid, ridden horses? Most of us have ridden horses. Um, some of you, maybe that's something that you've done a lot from when you were a kid and you're really good at it. And then you understand this, that the, the bit in the mouth of a horse will determine the direction the horse will go. And, you know, I'm probably one of the worst people to be talking about this because I don't do well with horses. One of the things someone told me a long time ago in riding horses was, you got to let them know who's boss. And my horses always knew who was boss, and it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, they go wherever they want. They start eating the weeds, and the, the guide says, don't let them eat that. And so I pull the, I pull the rein up, and the horse tries to bite me. Um, so, I understand the importance of controlling the horse with the bit in the horse's mouth, but that doesn't mean I know how to do it. Uh, another example is the rudder of a ship. He says, and consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. I don't know if you can picture that, but a huge ship, and, and the wind, and the water, and yet the direction of this huge ship is controlled by the rudder. And so it's controlled by the person, the captain or whoever um, is, is steering it. Uh, and so the parallel thought here is that that's how the tongue is, that we need to learn how to control the tongue. Even though it's a small part of the body, it's so important, it's, it's so crucial. Listen to what Warren Wearsby says in his commentary on this passage. Both the bit and the rudder must overcome contrary forces. The bit must overcome the wild nature of the horse, and the rudder must fight the winds and currents that would drive the ship off its course. The human tongue also must overcome contrary forces. We have an old nature that wants to control us and make us sin. There are circumstances around us that would make us say things we ought not to say. Sin on the inside and pressures on the outside are seeking to get control of the tongue. This means that both the bit and the rudder must be under the control of a strong hand. The expert horseman keeps the mighty power of his steed under control, and the experienced pilot courageously steers the ship through the storm. 
When Jesus Christ controls the tongue, then we need not fear saying the wrong things or even saying the right things in the wrong way. I think that's good. That we need to be reminded of making sure Christ is in control. Because when he controls our tongue is the only way that it can be brought under control. And so in application, if our tongue or if our speech is that powerful, and it is, we need to allow Christ to be in control. Uh, what, we, what we would say, to control what we would say as he would a bit or a rudder. The second warning we see at the end of 5 and verse 6, and that's a warning that our, our speech is dangerous. The first warning was that it's powerful and needs to be under control. The second one is talking about the negative side, how dangerous it is. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. He says our, our speech is dangerous because it can spread destruction like a forest fire. It can ruin families and cause mob riots and destroy reputations and, and bring nations to war. I don't know how many of you um, have been around um, uncontrolled forest fires, but I remember when uh, there was a really bad fire in the Colorado Springs area and our daughter just moved out there and there was some question whether or not she was going to be evacuated. And we were constantly on the phone, you know, wondering what was going to happen. And fortunately, that fire got under control. It didn't jump over I-25, and um, she was able to stay in, in her place. And so, if you remember, though, some of these fires, they start with nothing. Sometimes it's people camping, and they have a, a little fire, and they don't put it out. I know there was a really bad one where... I think it was actually a forestry worker was burning up a love letter or a Dear Jane letter or something from her ex-boyfriend or whatever happened, and that caused, I think it was the Haman fire. It was a huge, huge fire starting from one little flame. One little spark can start that. And so that's something that we need to be aware of not only is our speech like a fire and it's powerful, but also... It's dangerous. It can ruin lives. And it tells us that these things, our speech, our tongue, our words, can have a corrupting influence on our whole person. Just as a fire is dangerous if left uncontrolled because it spreads, so also our speech. The whole person ends up being contaminated. Um, and it says the source of this is satanic or from hell. And so if you think about it, what I get from this is one of Satan's strategies to discredit us or to um, prevent us from being able to further God's kingdom is when people witness our words and the destructive nature of our words, when we're not allowing Christ to control what we say. The third warning we see in verses 7 and 8, and that is our speech is uncontrollable. It says in verse 7, Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. In other words, our tongues, our speech is wild and untamable. And he gives examples that every kind of animal uh, can be tamed. And I have some pictures of there of tamed animals. Um, those of you that are old enough, you know the kid in the... And the bottom left, who's, who's that? Timmy. And the dog's name is what? Lassie. Okay. Man, if you don't know Timmy and Lassie, you're missing out on a lot. <laughs> or maybe not. And then how about the animal next to that? Who is that? Babe the pig. Yep, that's, that was quite an interesting movie. Um, the parrot, you might not recognize. Anybody know that parrot? It's from a movie. Polly. Yep. And then the last one, who's that? Flipper, okay. All of these animals, I think they're all real animals. I don't think they're puppets or 
animation. I don't know. I think they're all real animals. But they, they had to be tamed. And so the idea here is, wow, you can tame a wild animal or even a domesticated animal. You can actually use them in a starring role in a movie, but yet our tongue is not tameable. Our, our speech is not controllable. It, it stresses here human inability. And uh, I don't know, are any of you Twilight Zone fans, the old, old Twilight Zone? Almost nobody, just a few of you. I used to love watching the Twilight Zone marathons. I forgot which holiday that is that has them. But that was one that was really disturbing to me when I was a kid. And I haven't seen the rerun of it in a long time. It was about a man who was just talking all the time. And I don't know if his boss or somebody just finally got disgusted with him. And he said he would give him so much money. And back then it was probably only like... $50,000 today would probably be $2 million or something if you would just stop talking. And if you can go for, I don't know how long it was, three months or whatever it was, then I'll give you this money. And the guy was, um, he was in need of money. And so he ended up being able to do it. He got through that whole time without talking at all. And the guy gave him the money, but then he, uh, no, the guy didn't give him the money. I remember he, he, he gambled away the money. And the guy was really mad because he had a surgeon cut out his vocal cords because he knew he couldn't control uh, his speech. There was no way he couldn't talk. And so he was willing to do that to get the money. He ended up not getting the money. But the point here is this is difficult. Anybody agree? Any amens out there? Is it difficult to control your speech? Oh my goodness, it really is. That this is something that isn't easy. Um, and I think the example here is that you've got all these um, wild animals that can be tamed, but yet our speech can't be tamed. And someone said, we wouldn't allow wild animals in our church or in our homes, but we have uncontrolled tongues available all the time. We see that so much where relationships are ruined, feelings are hurt. Um, what was the expression in World War II? Loose lips sink ships. It has to do with revealing things that you shouldn't. And then the fourth one is our speech is inconsistent, starting in verse 9 through verse 12. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. He's saying our speech is inconsistent. In other words, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And he gives the example of it can be both used to bless and curse. From the same mouth, we can say positive things that are uplifting and helpful and encouraging, and then we can turn around and cut people down and maybe even scar them for life. And the exhortation is it shouldn't be this way. This isn't right. It's, it's inconsistent. It's, it's hypocritical. And sometimes it's easy to think we're spiritual because we sing songs of praise and worship on Sunday, but then maybe even the same day we speak evil of people who are made in the image of God. He says, this isn't right. The illustrations he uses are, are ones that would be very familiar to the people of that time. Uh, one is about a spring that doesn't have both sweet and bitter water. My guess is what happened in those days is they knew which springs were safe to drink out of and which ones weren't, which ones had a good taste and which ones don't. I remember um, every once in a while when we'd go out to eat different places, there were some that would stay in my mind that if you order water from there and it was out of the tap, it was terrible. You guys know about that? There are certain communities that have really good water and certain communities where the water is terrible. And I can't think of them right off, and I'd probably get in trouble if I shared which ones. But it's true. And he's, he's saying that it shouldn't come from the same source. If it comes from the same source, it should be 
consistent. He says a fig tree doesn't produce olives or a grapevine figs. That wouldn't make any sense. And so he says, if you call on the name of Jesus as your Savior, if you, if you call yourself a Christian, you should have a consistency in your speech. You know, in conclusion, God's given us a great gift in our speech. We can use it for evil or we can use it for good. When I used to do a lot more counseling, I was uh, amazed at hearing the scarring on people's hearts of what people said to them, whether it was a parent or whether it was a boss or whether it was a teacher where they would tell them, you know, you're never going to accomplish anything or, or you're, you're a, a failure or you're a fool. And they carry that with them because words are powerful. And on the other hand, it's so encouraging to hear what words helped you, what words gave you life, where people took you aside and said, you know what, I'm so proud of you, you're so good at that, that's something that you should look into. I remember early, early on as I um, was involved in different areas of ministry uh, as a college student, one day one of my elders took me aside, one of the elders at my church, and he says, you know what, I think you should pursue teaching the Word because you're very gifted in that. That helped steer me in the right direction. God used that. Those were words of life, and maybe you can think of that, a mentor or a friend or a parent that gave you words of encouragement that helped direct your life. And Think about how you could do that for others. We all have those opportunities. We need to let God control our words. We must yield ourselves, our hearts, to him. Romans 12, 4 says, I urge you to present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Just go to God and say, God, everything I have is yours. I offer it to you. Use me, Lord, to be a blessing. Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4 says, Lord, Set a guard for my mouth. Keep watch at the door of my lips. Do not let my heart turn to any evil thing or perform wicked acts. Let's bow our heads. Father, we recognize how often we fail in this area and how weak we are. And Lord, uh, I, I pray that we wouldn't just blow this off, but that we would take it to heart that we would uh, examine our own lives and say, God, um, is, is my speech pleasing to you? Do the words I say encourage or tear down? Um, Lord, help me to know that this reveals where my heart's at. And Lord, I pray that with the new heart that you've given every believer, we would live out of that new heart and not out of our old nature. And Father, I also pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know your son is their savior that they wouldn't leave today without talking to me or one of the elders or somebody else about how they can come to know Jesus Christ by faith by trusting in him thank you Lord for this time together in Jesus name